Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at the DNA double helix, complementary base pairing, anti-parallel strands, and then we'll finish with a summary. So DNA is one of the most important molecules in life, and it has a particular structure that you need to be aware of, and it's a very unique structure not seen by many other molecules. So in this particular part we'll be talking about how the DNA is arranged in a shape known as a double helix. So the structure of DNA was actually discovered by two very important scientists known as Watson and Crick and this was in 1953. So on the left here we have Dr. Watson, and on the right there we have Dr. Crick. The structure of DNA was discovered in 1953. But actually their discoveries were based on some of the research or the pioneering research done by another doctor known as Rosalind Franklin. So it was actually the combined efforts of these people that led to our current understanding of how DNA is structured. So the main discovery that Watson and Crick found with DNA is that it's arranged in a particular shape known as double helix. So what it's made of is, you may have seen this image several times before, it's like a ladder that's been twisted around its long axis. So it's composed of two very long polynucleotide chains twisted up into a shape known as a double helix. So what you have to remember is that, just going back to what a polynucleotide is, if we have individual nucleotides as monomers, when we join them all up in a chain, we end up with a chain of nucleotides known as a polynucleotide. And what we have in this case is we have two of these, so we have another one facing it or adjacent to the other polynucleotide. And if you imagine these two coming together, we form this overall kind of ladder shape, looking like a step ladder. And if you imagine down the middle, we get the two ends of this ladder and we twist it about itself like you might twist an elastic band. You then end up with this double helix shape. So we've got one strand here, so one strand known as a polynucleotide labelled there. This one's going along this course down the molecule, and then the other strand kind of follows it halfway behind. So this would be strand number two, so two strand. So the DNA is made up of two strands, which are polynucleotide chains, twisted to make a double helix shape. So that's what the overall shape is. It's known as a double helix. So now let's talk about what the actual double helix is made of and what forms this particular shape. So the sides of the DNA double helix are basically the outer edges or the, the sides of the ladder. And they're made by two parts of each of the nucleotides. And that's the pento sugar, which is represented by this pentagon here, and the phosphate groups. So these form together the sides of the ladder which are twisting around each other and those sides are known as the sugar phosphate backbone. So just to use a diagram to explain this, so what we have here is we have the strand that's going on this course, which is polynucleotide number one, and then we have polynucleotide number two, sort of going in the opposite sort of twist to it. And here we can see that obviously the chain is polynucleotide, so it's made of lots of individual nucleotides. So here we have one of those nucleotides, and then we have the next one, and then the next one, and so on and so forth. And remember, in the nucleotide, we have the pentagon, which represents the pento sugar. And that's attached to this green circle, which, remember, is the phosphate group. And what you have is, because it's joined together and all of these nucleotides are connected by a phosphodiester bonds, you have this continuating alternation of pento sugars and phosphate groups, and then the next pento sugar, and then the next phosphate group. So overall, the actual strand that's making the outside of this ladder is what we call the sugar phosphate backbone. Because it's an alternation, of sugar units and the phosphate that they're attached to, and then the sugar and the phosphate of the next nucleotide, and so on and so forth, making that backbone of this polynucleotide. What we then have is the bases going into the inside of the DNA molecule, and they form different interactions. But the important thing is that the sides of the double helix are made from these two groups, which are known as the sugar phosphate backbone. So that's the outside of the DNA molecule. Now let's look at the inside. Remember the DNA nucleotide has three parts to it. We've got the phosphate, we've got the pento sugar, which we've talked about just now, and we've got the organic base. The organic bases face the inside of the ladder and they're known as the rungs of the DNA molecule. So the two strands of DNA, the two nucleotide chains that we were just talking about, are held together by a particular type of interaction that you may have heard of before called a hydrogen bond. So it's a type of force that attracts the two strands together. And these hydrogen bonds occur between the bases of each of the chains, and these are what we call the rungs. So the rungs of the ladder are represented by these hydrogen bonds between the bases. So just using a diagram again to explain this, we've got our sugar phosphate backbone here, and then per nucleotide we obviously have one organic base. So for this nucleotide, we've got this organic base here. For this nucleotide, we've got that organic base there. So the base of one polynucleotide chain has to interact with the base of this nucleotide, which is in the opposite polynucleotide chain. So these interactions here 
are the hydrogen bonds between them. So this is the base of chain one. This one is the base of chain two, or the other chain. And they have to connect together to make the rung of this DNA molecule. These are the rungs here, which you can imagine you'd put your foot on if you were climbing a ladder. So these lines here represent the hydrogen bonds between them. That's what makes the rungs of the ladder. So now you can hopefully see that we've got a chain of nucleotides here and a chain of nucleotides here interacting with each other via the bases, with the backbone being made of the phosphate and the sugars. We can also describe the double helix in a way that is known as anti-parallel. So they're obviously parallel because they run in the same direction, even though they're twisted around each other. But actually, the strands of the DNA run in opposite directions. And we'll go into this in a bit more detail in a moment. But if you look at it, we've got the pentagon with the phosphate kind of coming up in that direction on this side. And then the base is obviously forming the inside of the DNA. But on the other strand, they have to run in the opposite direction. The pentagons have their phosphates facing that way. And so it's almost like they've been turned 180 degrees around. So it's really important that one strand runs in one direction and the other strand runs in the opposite direction. So that's why we call it anti-parallel, because they're parallel, but they're running in the opposite directions. So now let's talk about what we mean by complementary base pairing. And this is a really important feature of DNA and actually important in how DNA works in developing our body and the body of all organisms. So we've talked about how the two polynucleotide strands are held together by hydrogen bonds between the two bases. So just to recap, we've got the bases facing the middle here, representing the rungs, and we've got these hydrogen bonds that form between the bases in the middle there. But the way that the bases interact with each other is very important, and it's very, very specific, and it works the same way through all of life. So remember, we can have four types of base when we're talking about DNA. We can have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, and they only pair up in specific ways. A, or adenine, always pairs with thymine, so they would come together and interact to form this rung of a ladder. Guanine always reacts with cytosine, so they would come together as a ring. If you ever had adenine facing cytosine or guanine or any other mismatch, they would never match up. So when we look at DNA and we have the rungs between the two backbones, it's always going to be either an A paired to a T or a C paired to a G, and that can be in either direction. So it's always going to be in this specific type of pairing, and this is what we call base pairing. So why do they pair up like this? Why can't A pair up with another A? Why doesn't C pair up with a T? It's to do with the interactions between the bases. So the correct bases pair up due to several factors. One of those factors is the number of hydrogen bonds that each pair of bases can form. So here we've got a diagram of some bases joining to another base. So here we've got a thymine base being paired to its match, which is the adenine base. Remember, A always pairs with T. The reason these two pair together is because they can make two hydrogen bonds between their molecules. DNA wants to make the maximum number of hydrogen bonds that it can because it makes it a more stable molecule. And these hydrogen bonds exist between atoms, or particular nitrogen and oxygen atoms, in the bases themselves. So A and T makes two hydrogen bonds, and you sometimes see it written as A two lines and then T, or T two lines and then A. A similar method occurs for guanine and cytosine. So we've got guanine here, and we've got cytosine, which is its match, and they actually make three hydrogen bonds. So A and T made two hydrogen bonds. G and C can actually make three hydrogen bonds. And this makes it very strong again. So again, this is due to certain interactions of particular atoms within those groups. So the reason they pair up this way is because that the hydrogen bonds between A and T and G and C are the most efficient, the, the highest in number, which makes DNA a very strong molecule. So this is why they want to pair up this way. It's also based on another factor, which is due to the sizes of the bases. So remember that we talked about how purine bases are known as the larger bases, and they come as either A or G, so adenine or guanine. Pyrimidine bases can either be thymine or cytosine, which are the smaller ones. Purines have two carbon rings, whereas pyrimidines only have one carbon ring, so they're smaller. The space between the backbones of the DNA molecule, so if we imagine the DNA molecule again as our double helix, the bases have to interact with each other, so they have to be the right distance between the backbones. So it only actually has room to have one large base, which is a purine, and one small base, which is a pyrimidine. So this works, because that can make the right distance for a hydrogen bond and it doesn't cause any disruption to the double helix shape. However, if you put in two large bases, so two purines, 
this is too much because they're both large bases and they cause a kink in the double helix structure and they would cause a general sort of destabilization of the molecule. So having two purines is too big. On the other hand, having two pyrimidine bases would not be ideal either because they're too small and they would be too far apart for any good hydrogen bonds to form between them. So you have to have one purine and one pyrimidine in every rung of the ladder. So it will always be A paired to a T or a T paired to an A and it will always be a G paired to a C or a C to a G. You'll never have an A and G because that would be two purines. you never have T and C because that would be two pyrimidines, so on and so forth. So this is why the base pairing is always as it is and it's complementary. So in any rung of DNA, it will either be an A and a T together or a C and a G. So because this makes the bonding between the bases very specific, we call it complementary base pairing because complementary things fit together well and want to stay together. So we always see in the rungs of the ladder an A paired with a T or a G paired with a C. Due to this base pairing, there's always the same percentage of particular bases in DNA. So if you think about it, every time we have an A, we have to have it joined to a T because it won't join to anything else. And every time we have a T, we have to have an A. This means that the amount of A, or the percentage of A, has to be the same as the percentage of the T's because you can always have an A with a T and a T with an A. This goes for the same with the C's and the G's. Remember the C's and G's attached by a three hydrogen bonds. So the number of C's you have is always going to be the number of G's that you have. And if there's ever a G, there will always be a C bound to it. So the percentage of C's will always be the same as the percentage of the G's. So usually what we find is that the C and G are each 30% of what's made up of the bases of DNA. And then what we also find is that A and T each make up about 20% of the bases in DNA as well. This makes the 40% of the rungs, and then the G and C makes about 60%. So that gives us our total of 100% of all the rungs. And this rule about how the number of A's and T's is equal and the number of G's and C's is equal is known as Chargaff's rule or Chargaff's rule after the scientist who discovered this. So we briefly mentioned how DNA has two strands which are running in different directions and so we call them anti-parallel. So let's talk about this in a bit more detail. We've talked about the two polynucleotide strands in the DNA running as the backbones but in opposite directions so we call them anti-parallel. So again just to recap we've got phosphates pointing in this direction for one strand but we've got phosphates pointing in that direction for the other, where the sugar is upside down compared to the other strand. So one runs in one direction, the other strand runs in the directly opposite direction. And what we say is that it runs in a particular number fashion. So we say it runs five prime to three prime, and prime is represented by this small apostrophe symbol. So one of the strands runs five prime to three prime, while the other strand runs three prime to five prime. These numbers will make more sense in a moment when we talk about the structure of the sugar. So in this respect, what you're going to have is on one of the strands, you'll have five prime at one end and three prime at the other. And on the other strand, you'll have three prime and five prime at the ends reversed. So they'll each run in different directions. So why do we call them three prime and five prime? Why can't we just say they run A to B or B to A? Well, they're named based on the sugar. So remember the nucleotide has the phosphate group, the pento sugar, and an organic base. The pento sugar is known as a pento sugar because it has five carbons. And we have to number these carbons so that we can refer to different points in the sugar. And if you look at the pentagon zoomed in over here, you can see that there's one, two, three, four, five carbons. So we've named them so that we can refer to them in chemistry as to whichever point of the molecule we're talking about. So when we've got carbon three, this is what we call the three prime end because it's facing this direction. So that's the three prime end. The five prime end goes towards where the five is. So that's going to be the five prime end. So in a mononucleotide, the carbon number 5 is bonded to the phosphate group. Carbon 3 has a hydroxyl group. So just zooming back out there, we've got the fifth carbon, which is this one here, and that's where the phosphate group attaches. Carbon 3 is here, and that's got a hydroxyl group. And remember thinking about condensation reactions, in a polynucleotide, the hydroxyl group on carbon 3 is bonded to the phosphate group of the other nucleotide, creating that phosphodiester bond because we make water in forming that bond. So this then makes our polynucleotide strand and it gives it a direction. So just to recap that, what we have now is we have these individual nucleotides with carbon threes and fives, but that's now joined to the previous nucleotide, which has its own number five and three, and so on and so forth. And wherever the five is heading to, the fives always tend to be higher than the three. So in this strand, the five prime direction is that way. And in this strand, the threes are always going down. So the threes are in this direction. 
But in DNA, you've obviously got two strands of polynucleotides, and we've already said that they run in opposite directions. So one is 5 prime to 3 prime, and one goes 3 prime to 5 prime. So if we were to look at it in this way, we've got this, again, this 5 prime way is facing wherever the 5s are going to, and the 3 prime way is down to that direction. But in this one, we've got it turned upside down. So the 3s are all going in this direction, the 5s are tending to head more in that direction. So we've got one strand that does 5 to 3, the other strand goes in 3 to 5. So it's basically just the opposite, and the numbers refer to whichever carbon is on the pentose sugar. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.